All right, guys. So this section, I'm going to have Andrew Taylor on. I don't have a very specific title for it, but I just wanted to have Andrew on for a couple of reasons. First, in this business, I would say that Andrew has been the biggest between Andrew and a couple other people, but Andrew's probably been the most important mentor I've had in a lot of ways. Um, and dude, I don't even know if you fully know, like when I was just, just trying to figure out how to build a business, like, like John Wetmore taught me a lot about how to sell. And then I learned a lot about how to actually build and scale a business and the mentality behind it from you. And I literally was just trying to figure out what I was doing. And during COVID, we moved to Vegas, like, like 50% so I could get somewhere where there's no state income tax and 50% where I could get around you more, you know? Um, so I appreciate you and I've learned a ton from you. And I wanted to have you on, you know, if you can, I want to go over a couple different things, but I think the first thing I wanted to go over was, you know, kind of the perspective that you had um, as a new agent, understanding this was a business you're going to build over a long time. And look, we talked about a lot when, with you, what I talked about a lot with you early on was you talked about, you know, when you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad and just understanding, like, if you stayed really focused on this business, how much money you could make both selling and building, like, mm -hmm. just kind of your overall perspective, how you look at insurance, you know, why you put so much of your life, like literally the last, what, 15 years or something like that into it, Ten like years. why you put so much into it, why you believe in it so much, as opposed to getting distracted and going like, you're like, I'm just going to do life insurance. You were never the person that was like, I'm going to do, you know, real estate and, you know, base, and do all these other different things. You were like, no, I'm going to get really focused on this one thing. And I think let's start there, dude, and we'll go back and forth. Yeah, for sure. So uh, thanks for having me on. Um, a lot of you guys on the, on this, I was telling Zach, the company was built based on the synergy of a lot of people. And without everybody together, I don't think it would have worked as the way it did and the way it's working now. Um, mm -hmm. But so thank you for having me on. Um, just to kind of rewind a little bit. So I don't know, you know, what phase you are in business, but let's say you're new. When I was brand new, I had a very simple goal, like extremely simple, because I was working at the grocery store. And my goal was to make, be able to make one sale a month. And I would make the same amount that I did at the grocery store. So, and I was pretty, I was kind of shy. I wasn't shy, but I wasn't really outgoing. Like people wouldn't go, that guy's going to sell a, a bunch of insurance ever. I would be the last person they picked in the room for that. So I thought, hey, this could be pretty bad. Like I could be pretty bad, but if I could make one sale a month, then I could make the same amount making $8 and 50 cents an hour. Um, and so, something interesting happened at the grocery store. So I always wanted to make money so I could control my own schedule. It was never about having like more stuff or flashy stuff or anything like that. It was just, Hey, one day when I have kids, which I do now, I want to be able to, spend time with them. I want to be able to do the things I want to do. I want to be them to do what they want to do. Um, so that like, that was my goal. It was never about having a nice car or a big house. It was just about buying time back, but a checker at the grocery store, Ricardo, uh, he, he gave me a book, rich dad, poor dad, while I was working there. And it talked about buying like instead of if i had eighty thousand dollars if i ever save that up instead of buying a porsche buy a house and then that house would pay me a few hundred dollars a month in profit and then use that profit to buy the porsche so that way i don't have to work to pay the bill of the porsche or opposed to so basically instead of buying something buy something that pays you and then buy the thing you want with that money um and I, I, I loved real estate for multiple reasons. One, I didn't really like talking to people that much and real estate doesn't really talk to you. I mean, unless you have, you're dealing with tenants or something. Um, so, but my goal was to make money in insurance to buy real estate. And I think it's always really cool if you have a vehicle like this one that can fund what you're passionate about.
And maybe it'll be this that you're passionate about. But this is a really good ve vehicle to do that. Now, Zach, I, a lot of people would, would be like, oh, I would tell people my closing ratio because I wasn't really good at in the beginning. I would close about 25% of my sales. And um, people would be like, dude, that's awful. But I would just run more appointments to keep up with the top producers. Like I would run double the amount of appointments to keep up with them. And um, then I started to get good and I started to be able to re like read people, read people just like the tone of their voice. I could tell what they were going to do and I could stop an, a, an objection from coming before I even get it. And I started to realize, oh, I'm getting better. Then we looked back at my appointments. I ran 10,000 appointments. So <laughs> think about how many appointments that is. Like we went through my schedule. 35 appointments a week, every single week, 10 years straight. And it's like, oh, no wonder you're getting better at doing this. But something interesting happened. Um, I started to fall into the rat race, like the book said not to. So even though I was making more money, I was spending more money. And then I was um, like, I would, I on January 1st, I'd be like, oh, I have to do this again to pay my bills. Mm -hmm. Do this again. The, all that work I did, I have to do again. So I'm like, oh, shoot, I'm following the rat race. So I started to look at real estate a little bit. And I would save money to buy a real estate property. And my math would always be like this. It'd be like, okay, if I could, if I could spend uh, 100K on a property... I would try to get like 1% return on that per year. So if I could spend 100K, then I would try to get like 10,000 per year off that property. Now that could be the down payment. It could be if you could find a place that was that cheap, it could be whatever it was. But that was my magical formula that was so, you know, that I, that I used. And I worked hard, save money, go buy real estate. And then one day I was like, looking at the insurance industry, the 2 million people I'm in insurance, building a small team, but not really passionate about it. And I'm like, dude, if I hire one agent with a 10% spread, and I can teach them to sell 10 policies a month, I'm going to make the same amount of money per month as I would on that 100k property. But I don't need 100k to do it. Okay. Mm hmm. So in real estate, people call this, how many doors do you have? I started to think, well, if I have agents, could I look at them as doors? If I hire, if I recruit agents to sell and I get an override for training them, that could be considered a door. Now, there was one thing that was interesting. Like you have to go through like 10 people that start selling to find one legit one. Mm -hmm. At least I did. So I just needed to know the numbers so I didn't get frustrated. But when everything's all said and done, was it worth 10 people to create that cash flow? And sometimes it could be more. Like if you find you or a, or a Grady or someone, then it's like those numbers are absolutely insane. Um, so what I started to do, Zach, is I'm like, okay, let's run a real company now. So instead of me selling insurance, let's turn this into a real company. How does that look and what should the expectations be? So that, that looks like recruiting people you know, teaching them to do the same thing, helping them get paid, me selling and leading the way. So people are like, yo, this guy's every single week, holidays, weekends, everything. He's out there selling with us. He's in the trenches with us. And then reinvesting that money into some type of recruiting. And this is, this is how simple this formula was, Zach. Check this out. So I got to the point where I spent a thousand dollars a month on ads. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know what my goal was to get one agent to write 20 policies a month. You know how many agents I wanted to get that per year. As long as you got probably one, you were fine with it. If I got one for the yeah. whole year. So if I got one for the whole year, that would get paid for. But the next year I still had that one. So I started to go, oh, let's run a real company. Let's spend money. Let's go all in. Let's do all these different things in an industry 
Now, the, the other kicker was this, dude. There's so many people that are in the industry already and they're at low comp or they don't use leads or they don't have the right fit. So I'm like, dude, this is easy. And then what I learned, dude, is people follow you when you're when you you're you have like this burning desire to win and not fail because it's contagious. Mm -hmm. So everything we do is contagious, but dude, we want to be around, we want to do hard things because it makes us feel good when we achieve them, right? Yep. Um so so dude, I think I wanted to ask you real quick on that the hard things thing is a lot of people, it seems like recently like it's not our company, like a, a culture thing, like a social media thing you see is a lot of people are like work smarter, not harder. And like you want to do the least amount and basically do as little work as possible. Right. I don't know if you've seen that. I just feel like I've seen more of that. And it's like anti-hustle culture. I've seen it, but I've never seen it work. I've never seen it work. Yeah. And that's what I was going to ask you is like, you're talking about like working on holidays and stuff like that. Like, how what, another thing I took from you that like, dude, I literally like pretty much live by this principle that you taught me where you were like, if most people don't want to do it, then I do it because I know most people won't do it. And like, you said that one time on a call and I was like, holy, like that, like dude, I started like thinking about every time I came across something I didn't want to do. I was like, oh, everyone else feels that way. So if I do it, I'll be that far ahead. Like you and just so the people who don't who who don't know this Andrew's company ffl usa is like 46 percent of ffl like you're the biggest agency and it's not remotely close but when i started you were not like there was an agency that was twice the size of you i think in 2018 actually maybe three or four times the size of you so how do you think like that mentality that you took where you were like i just want to do extra and like work like everyone else is saying like just work smart and you know enjoy time with your family blah, all that stuff which is important but you were like, dude, I'm going to do all this extra stuff. Like how much of that play into you blowing up to being so much bigger than everyone else do you think? Well, one, anything you, anytime you do that and you don't share it, you're losing money. So yeah. I, I, I'm a big, I'm big on doing stuff and then sharing it. So dude, I had, and I always say this, like if you're on this call, if you want to make this work, you have to have a burning desire to change your situation. And if you don't have it, then it's going to just, it's just going to fizzle out. Mm -hmm. But let me give you some examples of what that is, okay? Um, and I'm going to tell you guys some real stories. So one, 9.15 p.m., I'm 25 years old. I'm calling leads still at 9.15 because I don't have my appointment goal. Now, I don't even know if you're allowed to do that, right? But people filled out the form and I'm like, yo, one day when they die, they're going to thank me. Their family's going to thank me that I stayed up and made this call at 9 15 PM. And this lady answers. She's like, um, I get home every single night at 9 15 PM and I'm a nurse. Okay. Now, dude, I'm barely making it. Like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm paying my lead bill and paying my bills and like, starting over from zero every single week. And so, dude, I go to the appointment, okay? Now, we didn't do Zoom. So this was two and a half hours into LA, one appointment, driving. A lot of time to lit. You and dude, I recently went on a long drive and I listened to podcasts and all this stuff. I'm like, dude, I actually missed this. Like, Yeah, me too. Dude, there's so much time to listen, think, and and... I would just listen to sales training all day long, but I get to the place, lady buys a policy, 200 bucks a month, huge deal for me. Okay. When I'm leaving, she's like, Hey, I'm retiring and I have to do something with my 401k. There's a million dollars on her statement on the counter. Okay. I, I go, can I come back tomorrow? and give you the information. She's like, sure. Dude, I go back, I call AMS team. And I'm like, I need an illustration. I need you to tell me what to say. I need you to tell me how to pitch this, everything. I go back, dude, I write a $1 million annuity. 
Okay. And this was like me getting beat up all week, still on the phone, super late. And this is, I'm going to say this because this is a closed call, right? Mm -hmm. Is this going on YouTube? Not anymore. It's not. All right. So, dude, they were doing like a promo on commissions because they wanted more. Um, they, they, the Athene was trying to get more business. Dude, they gave me a deposit, one check for 96 G's. Is that crazy? Yeah. Okay. Now, dude, that's after hundreds of no's, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of no's, okay? Calling late, getting no-showed, getting no-showed in the hood, whatever. Dude, you name it. Mm -hmm. now, another Traveling week. across the country to sell. Traveling across the country to sell. And now, dude, that those things are the best things that, um, like those trips are the best thing that ever happened to me because it gave me that grit. Mm -hmm. Really, really work and really, really focus. Yeah. Another, another, another week calling all day and night. I went to San Diego, California. This is like a three hour drive. I booked, I think like 17 appointments to go see people. Dude, I'm at zero at six at, oh, 17th appointment, 8 p.m. The last day there, I'm at zero, zero. Everyone told me no, or they just no showed me. Mm -hmm. I go knock on this lady's door, an internet lead that had just come in. And I'm like, dude, I'm just going to go knock on her door instead of call her. Cause like I got notified this lead came in. Uh, I go knock on her door. She's leaving her house. And I'm like, yo, most people would not go stop this lady's car, like pulling out of the driveway. Cause I was walking up like, this is so uncomfortable. I go knock on her, on her window. She's like, oh yeah, I need that. Pulls her car back in the driveway. Go in. It's like a 1800 a month premium she's a brain surgeon and like this is what i want this is what i need done 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 thank you for coming over like dude all these things that happened that were good they happened when they like things weren't going good but i kept going and i could yeah. tell you those stories all day long like and i'm so, sure you have a million of them dude 100 percent. and I, I was you said like when you were just barely making it right and I remember when I was a new agent, I would call, I would call, I would call Wetmore a lot when I started to build a business and it was just new and I was selling a lot, but I was keeping like no money. It was going out, right? Like it was going out faster than it was coming in probably. And I remember calling him going like, is this normal? Like I'm working really hard. I was working probably 60, 70 hours a week, right? Maybe 80 hours some week, traveling all across, flying across the country. I'm like, dude, is this normal? And he was like, yes, yeah, just be patient, give it time and make sure you're actually doing what you can to get better and it will turn around as you get better as long as you keep your activity the same and i remember one day just go like over like a three month period going from having like no money in my bank account and negative on my credit card to like literally over like a six month period then having like multiple six figures because i just kept doing the same stuff and i finally figured it out a little bit and so like i i guess i wanted to ask you like a most people, and again, you have a lot more experience with agents than I do, but most people do not come in and just crush it right away unless they have experience. Is it pretty normal for people just to feel like they're just barely making it and then just like kind of one day like a light switch, just boom, all of a sudden then they get better? Dude, my uncle Jimmy is here right now in the office. Who's like my favorite person in the world, dude. He's awesome. Yeah, he's crazy. He's the best. Um, but he, check this out. So he had month after month of like 5K, 6K, 5k 6k and then finally dude he broke 35k for a month and now he's like dude now that i did it once i'm just confident i can do it again and he has his little formula his routine he sticks to but he starts at six in the morning he's like dude if i don't start early i don't win and he starts he starts his appointments on the east coast at six in the morning it's awesome but yeah dude uh jack you said it and he's like one day <clears throat> It's like the monkey's off your back. It's like, but I don't know. I also have like, I remember like 
just a few years ago thinking like, did I, does this still work? Yeah. You have different problems as you get bigger. Right. And you have to deal with different things. Well, do one thing you mentioned confidence with Jimmy. Right. And like for perspective, I went, I, I was telling you this when we talked the other day, I went to a wedding the other weekend and saw a bunch of people I hadn't seen in a long time. And one of them was like, man, you seem so different than when we were in college together. Like you just have a different, you just carry yourself differently, which I'm like, well, that's good. Cause I was a complete idiot in college. So I hope I'm a little bit different. He's like, you just seem more confident, but not in like a, not in like a complete asshole type of way. And I was like, I guess it's a good compliment. Like it's a half compliment, but I was thinking about that. I'm like, dude, I think that how you get confident in this business is all I know how to do, but you just do you just keep doing it. And then as you eventually get better, you feel good about it. And then you're confident, right? Like you just keep selling enough until you get better and you just keep recruiting enough until you get better. And I think like, if you just do something and go through the process of sucking and getting better, I think it's really good for your self-esteem, right? So everyone dude. on here who doesn't feel confident, like, dude, I was so, so like unconfident and like even embarrassed in what I was doing when I started. Bro, I, I didn't even tell my parents for six months. I was a secret agent. I was a secret agent too. Yeah. And I think that I just got more confident just from stacking up little wins and like, dude, little wins, like booking an appointment and not getting, not getting hung up on, not getting no show, you know, but yeah, dude, for me, other... dude, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say the other thing, the thing that helped me with that was having non-negotiables in my schedule that were easy to hit. So like I would, and like, a lot of people go like, I want to hit Hall of Fame. Like I was so bad in the beginning. I was like, I just want to book 10 appointments my first week. And it was attainable. And I did it and kept moving the bar up as I got a little bit better. But I didn't, I was going to ask what you, what are some things you've done, you know, talking to newer agents or agents who are on here, like I'm not performing my best, but I really am actually willing to do it. I just am not confident. What are some things they can yeah. do to build up? Well, that? for one, your heart's got to be in the right place and you don't want to learn the hard way like I did. Um, but this is what happened to me. So Zach, I would, I wouldn't talk to people I knew about insurance. Mm -hmm. I was like too proud. It was, it's actually very strange. Um, and a friend of mine's dad goes, Hey, I, I need insurance. And I, I didn't close him. I was just like, yeah, I'll send you some information, like text over some information, like whatever. Right. But he was saying, I need insurance. And then a uh, couple months go by and Christmas, he ends up dying. Let's just heart attack, mm -hmm. dies. Okay. No insurance. Zip. I go to the funeral and the family's struggling and they have this financial burden. And I'm just like, dude, I didn't. I was so worried about what people would think about me that I didn't do the right thing and like help someone else. And then that day I was like, dude, I don't care what people think. I'm going to like, I'm going to tell everybody about this. You get all your money back. It's the best thing ever. And I started to get a lot more confident talking to people because I believed in it so much. And I put a picture of of that person and and the few people in my life that had passed away on my desk. Well, actually, I also carried a little folder around with me everywhere that had my work stuff in it. And I had their pictures in there. And that just reminded me when I'm calling somebody that I'm not bothering them, that I'm helping them. Because I would always revert back to, I'm going to bug this person. I'm going to bug this person. I'm going to bug this person. And then the other crazy thing, dude, I don't think I told you this, Zach. So when I was a kid, my dad died and my mom had no job, no life insurance, no money. Okay. So she got fi uh, financial aid, which is like a 800 bucks or something um, per kid to help take care of the kids from the government. But now my mom's a beast. So she ended up getting two jobs and like, she's awesome. But shortly after that, and I remember this, which is weird. There's a dude over at the house going through a bunch of papers with my mom. 
and it it was a life insurance guy and she was getting a policy through AIG for like 20 bucks a month in case something happened to her that there was some money left for us to to help raise us and I'm like dude think about how insane that is crazy so like if you really think about the value of what we're selling it sometimes you got to look in the mirror and be like why why am I not closing people and back to thinking about yourself dude I identified this early on like when I was calling people I would be worried about what I sound like on the phone do you see a problem with that? Yeah. It's not instead about you. Of, instead, of, it's not about me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But when everything's about you, you ain't you're not closing anybody. Right. You know? And so I'm like, dude, what I'm not I'm not even paying attention to what they're telling me because I'm more worried about how I sound. And then I was like, you know what? I don't care. I'm just going to I'm willing to even push all of a sudden to get deals because I know it's good for them. And then I, yeah. one time I was like, like, just pretending like, you know, that something's going to happen to them. Well, some, like, something, is. something they're going to die at some point. If you knew it was tomorrow, what would you say to get them to do it? Exactly. Would you let them off? And you can't tell them it's tomorrow, but like how, how much would you push if you knew they're going to die tomorrow and you couldn't tell them you knew a lot. So I started pushing, dude, and I may, I had this rule. I go, dude, I'm not, I'm willing for them to get mad at me for me to try to help them. Yeah. Like, I'm willing for them to get mad at me. And you can do it in a respectful way where they're not throwing you out of the house, but they're, you know, there's some tension, right? Dude, or even on the phone, man. Yeah. You can challenge people over the phone. It's like um, in Talladega Nights where they're like, as long as you say it with all due respect, you can say whatever you want, right? So the last thing I wanted to ask you, um, so we'll wrap up with this, is like there's in business, but specifically in our business, we get paid really well, especially if you're managing and building a team, because there's a decent amount of risk. That's why the pay is the way it is, right? Um, and so with there being some risk, bad stuff is going to happen, right? Like even if you're just an agent, you're going to have to charge bad. You're going to have lead orders that don't work out. If you're a manager, you're going to have roll-up debt. Like, stuff happens. But if you're willing to deal with that, again, like, 99% of people won't. The 1% will get paid really crazy. What I wanted to ask you was, you know, when you decide you're going to just deal with something crappy that happens, what are some things that you've done or maybe some frameworks you have to not get, to not get overly emotional and let your emotions cloud your judgment when something bad happens? Like, how do you deal with that without making For one, it's decisions? like it's like a muscle. So the more that things happen, the less, the stronger you are. So you're building your muscle over things. And dude, these aren't bad things. Bad things are you get cancer, you get hit by a truck, something yeah. happens to your family member. These are not bad things. These are just things that are part of business. And dude, the best thing that Sean ever did for me, Sean Mike, was I was complaining to him in my air conditioned car. Okay. Mm -hmm. Eating food, <laughs> which I shouldn't have been eating because I definitely was not working out then. And I was not eating good. Yeah. Eating food that I shouldn't have been eating with my AC on with my nice new shirt on that I bought with my computer. And I was complaining, to, complaining to him how I got no showed and how mad I was because my day was going so bad. And he was he was like, dude, have some respect for yourself. People, this was a long time ago, bro. This was when Haiti got hit by a hurricane and got destroyed. Mm -hmm. And he was like, dude, people are looking for their families under rocks right now. And he was like, you're complaining about somebody not being home. I was like, bro, that is true. So it, it's all about your, your perspective. This whole thing is about your perspective. So once you, if you can keep that perspective, you're not going to get mad if you get a charge back or something happens. The other thing is in Think and Grow Rich, I read a long time ago, every bad thing that happens, there's an opportunity for an equal amount of good. So if mm -hmm. it's really bad, there's an opportunity for an equal amount of good.
somewhere if you find it and you work for it. So I, I, I sold myself on whatever thing, whatever thing that happens that is not going my way, I'm going to find the equal opportunity of good in that thing. And I, I want to give you an example of that. I had a client I wrote, I had a $27,000 commission, which was huge. I had already spent the money before it hit my account. <laughs> yep. Well done that. Okay. So then the lady calls and says, Jackie from triple a told me this is a scam and I want to cancel it. Okay. So Jackie from AAA was stealing my policy. So I got a $27,000 chargeback because of Jackie from AAA. Okay. Bro, I was, I literally was like whimpering in, in my sleep <laughs> thinking about it. I was so upset about it. And then um, I was like, okay, what's the, what good is going to happen? So I went back to the client. I think, I think I counted how many times I went back to the client because I wanted to save the deal. I went back 13 times, dude. That has to be a record. Mm -hmm. Well, a few months later, I ended up saving the deal, which was cool. Yeah. So I got my commission back because Jackie from AAA was lying. But that wasn't the that wasn't the good part about it, dude. The good part was there was no chargeback that was going to cripple me. Yeah. So like when I got the small ones, I didn't feel them anymore. And I was more confident when I went to go save them because there was no emotion behind it. It was just logic. So I would call every chargeback I got. I would call them back and I would try to save the deal. And like 50% of the time, roughly, I would end up saving the person that canceled because I called them back and went through everything, adjusted it, changed it, lowered it, whatever it was. But I had no more emotion there. So I always tell everybody that was the best chargeback I ever got. Yeah. So whatever that's a, it is. Just deal with, that's a very like, very stoic way of looking at it, right? It's like either something happens, it's not good or bad. It's either you can learn from it. And if you can't learn anything from it, you can't do anything about it. Just move on because you can't do anything about it, right? Just keep moving yeah. forward. So I appreciate And that, that's helped me a lot too, dealing with things. I was telling you the other day, like, if I know if I'm angry about something, because I'll get fired up about stuff sometimes, as you know, like, dude, I just, I won't, I won't call the person or do anything wrath until I'm no longer angry, which has saved me a lot in relationships and business. Cause I'll say something off the wall to someone in a second, if I'm in the moment. Yeah. So like thinking like how you think about stuff has helped me a ton, but I appreciate it, dude. This has been super valuable and I appreciate your, uh, your insight and mentorship yeah, as always, Thanks man. For having me. See you guys. No doubt. All right, guys, this section, I have Paul Smith on. Um, for those of you who don't know Paul, Paul has more experience than almost everyone on our team in the insurance industry. You've been doing insurance for like 10 years, right? Yep. Um, and you've sold a lot. You've built a great team. And you've sold a bunch of different, I want to say atmospheres, I guess, or different companies where you've been captive agent. You've been a broker now. So I think you have a really unique skill set because you've, you know, you've sold you know, like harder products to sell to, you know, people who didn't even know what they were getting. And then you've sold, you know, mortgage protection, internet leads. And I was talking to someone about the other day and they were like, oh, because they're using a new lead type now. And they're like, I'm able to buy more, you know, or buy higher quality leads for more expensive. It's really great. And I, I'm like, yeah, but you learned off of like $1 leads that you'd have to dial like a hundred of them to sell two policies, right? And I think that that's actually really valuable, but and you've been through that, just not here, but a different company. And I'm like, I'm so glad that I started out with really crappy leads because I'm like, oh, if I could sell those, like I could probably pick up a phone book, dial through it and sell some insurance to someone, you know, yep. just from all the crap. So um, last month you ish, you wrote like 60 policies, something like that ish. Yep. Right around there. On the month of August. We'll definitely have qualified for the cruise. You know, again, your team's uh, probably selling 150 to 300 policies a month somewhere in that range so what i wanted you to go over is kind of you know doing all telesales all one call closes basically you know unless you can't have the time like what does it look like for you from a structure standpoint um and you know how do you still structure in enough time where you can sell you do a lot of family stuff you have a farm like you have other things going on but you still sell at a really high level so 
if you could just first start off, break up like what your day to day looks like, I think that'd be helpful for people to understand like how intentional you are with your time. And then we can dive into some specifics. Yeah, definitely. So my schedule, I try to work Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. So everybody, even on my team, when I'm teaching them, I tell them the same thing that I'm on call is what it feels like. I'm on call from, you know, 9 a.m. in the morning till 8 p.m. at night. Now I'm not working straight through all those hours. But if I get leads that are coming in, I literally will just drop whatever I'm doing and I go and I work that lead immediately. I think if you're getting fresh leads in that are coming in daily, I don't care if it's internet or mortgage because I do both all day, every day. Um, cause I just want to get internet. You can get a lot of volume. And then I like, you know, direct mail or call in or mortgage ones. Cause they're a little bit higher intent, but I like to get them all in and every morning. You know, I'm always going to get leads coming in from internet leads that I can work from 9am to 11am. I always have at least two hours. I can start working that way. I'm never rusty on the phone. So I, I, I always start working first thing in the morning. And then I'm basically like, I, like I said, I'm on call. So if someone calls me, I'll drop in there and make a phone call and, just go to my bedroom and do it there or, uh, you know, and then I can, I can do things and manage everything I'm doing here on the, the farm really well too, where I can go be with the animals and, and go swimming with my kids in the pool. We homeschool them and, and do all this different stuff. So that's, that's about it for structure. There's really not much structure in the fact that I'm just, I don't call, like calling anybody after 8 PM when I do it. A lot of the times I feel like I'm ruining the leads or if they're in a bad mood or something. So I'll just work during those business hours, uh, Monday through Friday I don't really ever work on Saturdays and Sundays. I will a little bit on Saturdays if I'm bored or it's before football or I'm, you know, dripping on people that I've already presented to and, you know, they wanted to think about it and I couldn't one call close them. I'll try to follow up with those people on weekends when they're not working. So it's not really work to me. It's just like easy. I already, I've already done the presentation. Does that make sense? For sure. Now, when you were new in the industry, like 10 years ago, did you still do that where you didn't work weekends at all? Or did you work like all the time back then? Just to, all I'm the time. totally curious. What's that? All the time. Absolutely. All the time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure when you're trying to get ahead, you got to get ahead. Yeah. I was, I was thinking about that the other day. Like, dude, I used to literally work seven days a week when I was new. And I remember, so John Wetmore was probably like five years, four five, five or six years after I started in 2018. And he would sell two days a week and sell more than I could sell in seven days a week. And I was like, dude, what the hell? But I was going to like, well, if it takes me seven days to get what he can done in two, maybe I'll get better eventually, but I'm not going to just accept what my results will be on two days a week because I would have been out of the industry, you know? Right. Definitely. So I think it's important. You're like, I'm able to stay at home, you know, go swim in the middle of the day. But it's like, sometimes you don't have the luxury of doing that when you're new. You just got to grind 24 seven until you eventually figure it out. Right. hundred percent. hundred percent. Dude, I think people like really um, crap on, and we talked about this in the previous section with Andrew, but I think people really crap on like working hard a lot. And for me, I'm like, dude, if I didn't just sit down and grind, I wasn't good enough to not work hard, you know? So I think, I think people go in like, oh yeah, you should only work like six hours a week or a couple hours a day and really enjoy your life. It's like, for me, it's really hard to enjoy life broke. So. Um, 100%. Yeah. So, I, I punish myself if I don't get good results. Like I have to earn the right to go have fun in my mind. Like every day I'm trying to close deals every day. I'm trying to make money. If I haven't made any money, you can ask my wife and kids. I'm not in a good mood. I'm like, I don't want to hang out. I don't want to do stuff. I don't want to be with my family. Once I write three or 4,000 for the day, now I'm like, okay, I've earned to go chill for a couple hours. But then even then I'm like, I got to go check my phone, make sure if I got a new lead and I want to work it right away. So it's just yeah. that constant balance of, I always want to work hard. I always want to make money. But now that my kids are older, my kids are nine and 11 now. So they were literally newborns when I started in the industry and I grinded for like five to seven years and I missed every single dinner. I missed every single bedtime. You know what I mean? So I remember that. And now that they're like aware of if, if I'm around or not around, I finally get to have some sort of a balance where there definitely wasn't balance for like the first five, seven years. Yeah. No, I think you're right. You get to earn balance, right? And you either get nope. to earn balance and be independent or you don't work hard enough in the beginning and then you have a job where you'll never have balance because you have yeah. to work hours a week forever until you die. So um, on a more specific to the sales side, like, can you go through what it looks like for, like, if you were trying to give someone just a framework to work off of for you call someone, whether it's a mortgage or an internet lead, you know, what do you, how do you try to structure the call up front? And then, you know, what are you looking to accomplish to decide if you're going to jump into an appointment with that person and try to show them numbers and close them? Like, what does that process look like? Yeah. So basically after my intro, um, whatever the lead type is, if it's, Hey, you know, th this is Paul Smith. I'm giving you a call back. 
in regards to that request that you filled out online earlier today for some life insurance for like internet leads, for example, they'd be like, oh yeah, yeah. If that's all they say, I'm like, good. So anyway, I'm the licensed agent here in Georgia or whatever state I'm working because I run multiple states to help my, my volume. But I, whatever state I'm in, I'm the licensed agent here in Tennessee. They assigned to you. So do me a favor, Zach, go grab a pen and piece of paper real quick so I can give you this information real fast. That's my whole goal to, to start with is see if they're going to stop whatever they're doing and go grab a pen and piece of paper. If they listen to me there, then the phone call usually goes a lot better. If they're like, oh, I'm driving or this is a bad time or whatever, just kind of let you know how the call is going to go. But if they stop, sometimes they'll be driving. They're like, oh, let me pull over real quick. I'm like, yeah, we got a sale. They stopped driving to go get a pen and paper for me. This is great, you know? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah that, that's a wrap, right? They stopped driving. They're good to go. Yeah, so, to write stuff okay, down. So so I grab my pen and paper. I go, yep. okay, I got it. All right, perfect. Go ahead and write down my name. It's Paul Smith. And then write down my state license number for Georgia. It's 171, and I give them my NPN number. Mm -hmm. I want to do that right at the beginning of the phone call. Then they go, okay, I got it. I'm like, perfect. They have me leave you that number before we talk about anything. That way you know I'm licensed through the state to ask you these questions. Now, I got your address is blah, blah, blah. Is that correct? And then start verifying whatever info I have on the lead. Cool. And then once you go through and verify the info, you know, I say, oh, yeah, that's all correct. You know, how do you guide the call from there? Uh, I try to make it about why they filled this out. So I'm like, it looks here yeah, for an internet lead. It looks here, Zach, you were wanting to quote for uh, 150,000. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. Okay, perfect. Uh, let's see here. And your age is 42. Were you looking for, you know, some term or some whole life or you're not really sure? I don't know much about insurance. Yeah, I don't know how those work. I was hoping. You okay. Could yeah. <laughs> no worries. I can help you out with that. So, you know, term insurance, basically, you're going to get the most bang for your buck. It's going to be a big death benefit with a with a cheaper premium. It is going to expire at some point. And then when that happens, typically all the money you paid into it is gone. But with you being as young and healthy as you are, um, it looks like you'd qualify for some return of premium plans. Those are probably the most popular for your age bracket because at the end of 30 years, if you're still alive and never use this program, they give you a full refund of all of your money back tax free. So let me pull up those quotes and see if that's something that, you know, you like. And then you just, I mean, it's very fluid at that point. You know, you're going to want people that are people that are 75 years old, wanting ten five thousand dollar $5,000 policies, 20 year olds that don't know what they're doing. People that want IULs. You just never know. Just go with whatever they're, you know, whatever they're looking for. That's a good point, right? So someone the other day was telling me they're like, hey, this client really wants to do this thing, but I think the right thing for them would be this. And I'm like, look, I used to fight that when I was new too. And you can educate them. But the, the end of the day is if they're set on buying something, you know, then they're going to buy it from you or from someone else. So you might as well be the person that at least sets up whatever plan they're looking for the right way. And you might as well get paid on it. Right. But I used to go all the time. I'd be like, no, dude, you need a term ROP. And they're like, I just want a cheap term. And I would try really hard to sell them <laughs> that. And then they'd go like, okay, I'm just going to buy a term from someone else then if you're going to be a pain in my butt. Right. Yeah. Don't they're, fight it. Like you, you just kind of, you kind of feel out where they are, feel out if they have an idea of what they want. And then if they're like, I don't know, man, I just want your help. Then you're like, okay, this is the product I would go with. Exactly. Now doing telesales, what, what are you looking for as far as, you know, how many, you know, how many calls you're looking to make to get a connection and like how many people you talk to where you can actually convert those into appointments. Cause I think those are good for people to go off of numbers wise. Yep. Uh, you may not like my answer with this because I don't really track um, how many people ask me that all the time too. Like how many calls do you make? And what, I, I really have no idea. Um, until someone call, I never track calls either. So we always had the call tracker sheet thing and I never, yeah. I just didn't until I had enough sales or enough appointments. Right. Bingo. So, I'm just, so yeah, I'm shooting for money. Right. So like yeah. if I'm, if I haven't closed a deal, I'm just going to keep working all day. Yeah. You know what I mean? And if I close a deal, great. But for me, it's just a lot of, my leads are incoming right so once the leads come in you just work them right away as fast as you can and then a lot of times you know people will be driving in the car or they're like oh i'll present and get through my pitch is probably like 10 15 minutes from start to finish with account routing socials everything so i'll go as far as i can in the presentation as they let me i'm not trying to get their spouse there i'm not trying to book an appointment i'm just trying to present the more that i present and the more value that i can build up and the more times i can hear them say wow that's pretty cool now they want to actually show back up for a second phone call with their spouse and then we can you know it'll be a two call close instead of a one call close so i'll get a lot of appointments that i i, I talk to in the morning i'm rebooking them for the same day i'm like i work till 8 p.m tonight what time does your spouse get home? I'll call you back, put you on speakerphone. Don't feel the need to re-explain everything I just told you. You know, don't do my job for me. 
I'll, yeah. I'll call back at seven, re-explain all of it. We went over a lot of information. I threw a lot of numbers at you, but I'll still make them write everything down. And then if they hit me with, I want to think about it, blah, 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 the other spouse, I'll rebook it for that evening. So I'll book four or five appointments for the, for the same day after getting through the calls of leads that are coming in. Got it. Cool. And yep. then from ones that you actually go through and, and go over numbers with, you you close half of those, three quarters of those, most of them when you get them to that point or... I have no idea. Probably half, I would say. Got it. I think it's a good number, right? Yep. What I, someone was asking me the other day and I asked a bunch of different agents and I was like, look, if you talk to 10, you'll probably be able to show numbers to like four of them and you should close about two of those. it would probably be about right, you know? I think my uh, close ratio is still like 33%. That's kind of been like a normal close ratio for me. It's nothing special. I just, you know, spend a lot of money in leads and work hard and contact a lot of people every day. And I make sure that I never blank any day. That's pretty much it. Now, one thing people in the industry talk about a lot is like, they're very proud of their close percentage, but, and I know this because I've, you know, I've been in business with you for a long time, but your quality is very good. And sometimes I think people like, they're like, I close 90%. I'm like, yeah, well, your persistency is 30% or 60%. So you're really not closing 90%. You're getting 90% to say like, yes, you know, I will give you my bank account. They're not saying yes to a policy, right? Right. Um, so that's an important distinction. You you make sure like you're closing people that are going to buy and keep the insurance because you, you don't get to be in the insurance industry for 10 years and have people canceling all the time, right? Correct. So can you talk for a little bit on like if you've ever been through times where you just wrote everyone or why, you know, what you do to make sure someone is not going to cancel the policy once you sell it to them? I think it's just solidifying the deal. So for me, um, I get all their information on the first phone call, right? So if I call you and everything's going smoothly, I'm getting your, you know, uh, what state you were born in, height, weight, social, banking info, doctor's info, medical history. I'm getting all that info. And then I end the call. I go, perfect. Uh, Zach, I've got everything that I need right now. I'm going to start shopping this around for you. I'll give people ranges on prices too. So that's another way that I retain clients and I don't leave money on the table is I'm giving them, it's going to cost you anywhere from 140 bucks a month to 180 bucks a month. I, you know, as a broker, I'm going to start with the cheapest carrier and then work my way up. So I'll get them off the phone, get all the info. That way they're not annoyed if they get declined two, three, four, five times. That happens. And mm -hmm. they're just docu-signing and not having to sit there on the phone call with me where it may take me two hours to actually get an approval through somebody. So yeah. I like to get their info, get them off the phone. And then I'm like, I'll just text and email you back and forth, Zach, throughout the day. Just keep your phone on you if you would. And then I'll call you back once I get a final approval, okay? So that's how I end my first phone call. I get off and then we start typing it up. You know, my, me and Mallory, we'll start typing out, up, apps up and send DocuSigns and text. But then once I actually get an approval, that's where I think my retention comes in. Well, I'll call the client back because I told him I'd call him back once I get him approved. So they know right. text and emails is just, I'm just signing stuff. I don't even know what's going on. They have no idea what's going on. And then once I get him approved, I call them and they're like, okay, what's up? I'm like, hey, I got great news for you. I just build this call up well. I'm like, I got great for, good news for you, Zach. We got you approved. Uh, if you want to grab that pen and paper for me again, I'm going to have you write this down. I always have them write everything down. So there is zero confusion on price, coverage, and drafting. I feel like if, yeah. are, if they're clear on that, they're not going to cancel. If they know what the what the death benefit is, what the price is, you know, the living benefits, I'm going to remind you, I'm going to resell it on that like three to four minute call. Does that make yeah. sense? Um, and that's it. I'm like, you know, hey, you're going to get return of premium. It's 180 a month. At the end of 30 years, you're going to get a refund of $72,000 back cash, you know, tax free. If you have cancer, heart attack, stroke, or become disabled, you can get the full $300,000 and pay your house off, you know, anytime over 30 years. Just basically building that value again. I'm like, so you're, fu you're fully approved. Your first draft is going to come out on the 15th of this month. It's not going to come out right now. And then again on the 15th, just on the 15th. Okay. And this is my direct cell phone number. Write this down. If you ever need anything at all, if you need to increase, decrease, change anything, just call me directly. I'm always here for you. Perfect. And then, um, I mean, that makes a lot of sense as to why no one cancels, right? Because you're going back through and we have people that are doing telesales so like you and you're talking to other people who are half distracted or driving or whatever. And they may have been like, yeah, I bought a policy. I don't really remember and you go through it a second time, there's a way better chance that they'll retain it. And then if someone else tries to sell them a policy or whatever, like they're like, no, I know exactly what I have. Like I went through it twice with Paul. Um, last thing I wanted to ask that's you. Why my America retention is high. Thing. Oh, go ahead. go ahead. I was going to say, that's why um, my America retention is high. Because I get a lot of people calling me back 
um, and other agents trying to replace my policies, but they can't replace them because America has 100% return of premium and they have 100% living benefits where the other carriers do not. So if I really took my time highlighting that and had them write it down, they're like, oh, that's why I'm paying an extra 30 bucks. Okay, I'll stick with you. And they yeah. don't just jump for the first agent that throws out a cheaper term price. Right. No doubt. And the last thing I wanted to go over with you real quick, because you mentioned a lot of times you're doing a second call with them, following back up with people. And one thing, one thing I see that majority of agents are really bad at is being organized. So do you have any, you know, systems, do you use any, you know, automated systems or what do you do to make sure you're not forgetting about people you're supposed to be following up with? Um, and do you set any sort of reminders, use Ringy or anything like that to make sure you're having inbound stuff come to you? No, um, I do. I mean, I'm organized. <laughs> you asked a lot of questions there. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I, I do have a habit of asking like six questions at the same time. <laughs> I in there. But what are your questions? Are you organized? organized? I said no. There we go. Let me rephrase. So. Yeah. So I use everything from my iPhone. Um, I don't use any CRMs or ringies or, or burners or any of that stuff, mainly because I, I use that to my advantage when I'm tech. I, I call and I text people like crazy. And iPhone people love other iPhone people. Sorry for all the Android users that are listening to me right now. Yeah. But blue bubbles like seeing blue bubbles. And if they see that, they know it's not spam. It's not some telemarketer. So I'm always using that. It's really easy for me to stay organized too, because I'm always shooting for same day approval with all my clients. You know, I'm picking the carriers that are going to tell me yes or no right now. Your Americos, your Prosperities. Um, AMAMs, you know, there's a lot of companies that are going to tell you yes or no right now. So there's very, very rare where I have to send an app off to underwriting. And then still then it's like one to five days later, but they remind me, they send me an email saying, Hey, we need this question. We need this phone call, or they got declined. If I get a decline, I know, get back on it and find another carrier. Or if they got approved, I told the client, as soon as I find out from the underwriters, yay, yay or nay, I'm going to call you and let you know. So there's just natural reminders that come in already through FFL system where you don't really have to do a whole lot. You know, I have a notes uh, thing uh, in my iPhone that I stay organized with, with that. But beyond that, leads come in, I call them, I text them, I work them. I'm going to keep working until they get approved. And then that's, that's it. But I like working from my iPhone, mainly for the, the blue bubble iPhone effect. People like that. And I get a lot of sales from people that were really rude until they realized, Oh, that's somebody with an iPhone. That's a real person. I agree. Yeah. Moral of the story is if you don't have an iPhone, you're probably missing out on like 30 sales a month. Right. So <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate it, dude. Thank you. I provide a ton of value for everyone on here and I appreciate everything you do for the team, man. So have a good rest of your day, everyone. Thanks for joining. We'll talk to y'all later. All right. Thanks.